you stand and worship with us this morning? Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let His praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. I'm standing on the promises of God. Standing on the promises that cannot fail. When the howling storms of doubt and fear assail. By the living word of God I shall prevail. Good morning, everyone. It's good to see all of you here this morning. It's my pleasure to welcome you to Timberline. Why don't you grab a seat? My name is Lindsay. I work here in the office. Um, and I'm going to invite our ushers to come up first thing. So the first thing we're going to do this morning is lift our bucket offering. So if the ushers could come up for that. Um, our bucket offering is an offering we lift each Sunday in addition to our regular offering, which we'll do later. And everything that goes into the bucket offering goes directly to support different causes. So currently, everything that goes into the bucket offering um, is going to be donated to Serve Now and their efforts um, to start a food kitchen in Sri Lanka. So we had the privilege of sending a big chunk of money to them this week already, um, but everything that gets continued to be added to the bucket offering is going to be added to that. So thank you guys so much for giving towards that. Um, I have a couple quick announcements to go over. So most of these things are things that we have mentioned before, but just to give you guys some quick reminders. Um, tomorrow is our monthly prayer meeting at 7 p.m. here at Timberline. Everyone is invited to come out to that. Um, and then August 16th, it's a Friday, our Kidsman is hosting a father and son water party. So dads, if you have kids, or if you have sons age zero through fifth grade, you're invited to come out with them. There's going to be a water slide and a bunch of different age-appropriate water um, activities that are going to be a lot of fun. So please sign up for that. There's a sign-up sheet out in the cafe. Um, but fathers and sons, we'd love to have you come up for that. So my last announcement, I'm going to invite Benji to come up. Um, we have been talking about connection groups recently because connection groups are the aspect of our um, church life. That's how we as the body connect to one, 
to connect with each other and build community. So here at Timberline, our connection groups run over the course of the school year. So we usually kick them off in the fall, um, and then they run through the spring. So we're getting ready this fall to introduce our connection groups and kind of open those up again. Um, so this year, we've had interest in a slightly different type of group than we've had in the past. So Benji, what, what does that look like? What have people been expressing interest in? Uh, we line up at the beginning of the year, talk about the different types of groups that we have. Maybe there's one about marriage, there's one about inclusion, there's one about Christmas and Protestant. And what I've been hearing from people recently is that there's a desire to have groups that are less specifically focused on a topic and more interested in being a group together, doing life together. Obviously, still reading God's word together, still praying together, it's still a focused group that's desiring to grow in discipleship. But the topic is less important than doing it with the group. Um, they'd go through different topics. Now, there are some groups that are already doing that. I know Dave and Betty, they've been meeting for like 47 years in their home group, <laughs> and they just continue hitting another group, another topic as it comes. But I've just heard from some people, um, they're less focused on like the class material and more interested in the group that surrounds the class. Great. Um, so what is one aspect... Um, what is something else that we're hoping that these groups can facilitate specific to our church body? Yes. There's just been some interest in groups that allow for something, and what is that? Yeah, so if you've been around Timberline, you know there's a lot of little kids here. And we all know that little kids make a meeting space a little bit more lively and distracting. And so when, when your focus in getting together is to go through a class and get through the material, then there's usually not room for kids, and kids can't come to that. And I get it. I don't want to change that. We're still going to have all of our classes, and I think they're really good, and I would encourage you to consider them. But we also have a lot of parents with kids, and telling them to say, like, telling everyone, like, just go find a babysitter every week of your entire life probably just isn't going to happen. And so what we're doing then is we're not allowing any of our young families to participate in any of our groups. So I don't have the solution to that problem, but we want to think more creatively about what would it look like for young families to be a part of groups with each other, but even with older people as well, and make space for young people. So maybe instead of having an hour of class time where we're going to sit down and work through the material, we sit down over supper time, and we feed the family together, and we maybe just talk about the sermon and do a little Bible study about something that we're all familiar with, because maybe we, we were here on Sunday morning, we heard the sermon, or we listened to it online, and we already know it, and we're just talking about how we're going to apply it to our lives, and then little Johnny comes up and distracts the whole room, and then we go back to it and do it again. But realistically, if we're not going to allow kids to be a part of our lives, we're not going to allow families to be part of Timberline. And so we're trying to discover, maybe, maybe we share babysitting. Maybe, you know, I don't know what the solution's going to look like, but in theory, life groups could be open to doing it together as a family and maybe even exposing our kids to what we're talking about as a family as well. Great. And just so you know, some of the things that we're bringing up, these are all things that have been suggested to us, or you guys are already talking about these things, so we know that the ideas are out there. We're just looking to help facilitate that and maybe right. make different types of groups so that everyone at Timberline can be a part of a small group um, and be able to, to participate. So we have some interest. We know that. What do we need to make this happen? Yeah, so two things that I would like to hear from you. Um, one, if you have a house that's big enough to host a number of people, that'd be great, because as the, what's the word, inflation increases and generations continue to grow, most people that I know that are my age don't have a house that's big enough to have more than one other family. So we just need space. That's one thing. So if you would like to host a group, let us know. Also, um, just let me know that you're interested. If you like this idea and it sounds fun and you're less interested in this specific class, like I said, there are other classes going on and they are good and you should still consider them. Um, if you are interested in this idea, I just need to know, are we talking about 10 people? Or are we talking about 100 people as we go about planning? Because we want to announce all the groups here in a couple weeks. So if you have interest in that, just be in touch with me sometime in the next couple weeks. Great. Thank you so much. You. So I know it's the middle of summer still, but keep thinking about this fall and connection groups and what you would like to be a part of. We'd love to hear back from you. So this time, why don't you stand up, say good morning to each other, greet each other. We're going to continue worshiping.
15 says, Where, O death, is your victory? Where, O death, is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, he gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's continue to worship this morning. Who breaks the power of sin and darkness? Whose love is mighty and so much stronger? The King of glory, the King above all kings. Who shakes the whole earth with holy thunder? Who leaves us breathless in awe and wonder? glory, the King above all peace. This is amazing grace. This is unfailing love. That you would take my place. That you would bear my cross. You laid down your life. That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for All that you've done for me Who brings our chaos Back into order Who makes the orphan a son and daughter, the King of glory, the King of glory, who rules the nations with truth and justice, shines like the sun in all of its brilliance, the King of glory, the King above all peace. This is amazing grace. This is a the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy is the king who conquered the grave worthy is the lamb who was slain worthy 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 This is a failing love That you would take my place That you would bear my cross You lay down your life That I would be set free Oh, Jesus, I sing for all that you to receive glory and honor and power for you created all things and by your will they were created and have their being 
Amen. At this time, I'd like to invite all the kids to come up front, and we are going to have kids' songs with Laura. Good morning, everybody. Good, <laughs> Good morning. to see you. Good morning, yes. All right. So we're going to do a new song this morning. And um, so here's the thing, kids. Once you guys continue, as you continue to grow and as you continue to read God's word, it's important to be able to find stuff in there. So we're going to sing all the books of the Old Testament this morning in a fun little ditty. Um, I learned the books of the Bible when I was a kid in a song. It's not this song. It's a different song. But I still sing them in my head when I'm trying to find where to go in the Bible. So songs are very special in learning how to memorize things. My child basically learned this song this past week. And there's a lot of words that he has never heard before or known before. So um, we're going to sing all about the books of the Bible. So uh, we're going to put them up on the screen for adults and children that can read. Um, so feel free to sing along when you, uh, when you catch on. Ready, Ace? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, and Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi, and that's the Old Testament. All right, you guys think you can do that? Yeah, let's do it again. Here we go. Ready? Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That's the Old Testament. All right, what do you think? One more time? Can we do it just a little faster? We'll do it. Here we go. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings. First and Second Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, Esther, Job, and Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, Daniel, Hosea, Joel, Amos, Obadiah, Jonah, Micah, Nahum, Habakkuk, Zephaniah, Haggai, Zechariah, Malachi. That's the Old Testament. Good job. See? It's very simple once you get going with it. All right, we're going to do one more song. We're going to sing Whatever is True. You guys know this one. I didn't get someone to come do motions, so does anyone actually know all the motions to this and want to come do it? No? Okay. <laughs> okay. Okay. Benji's got it? Maybe? Yeah, come on up. Here we go. Ready? Whatever is true, 
Whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, think about such things. Let's sing that again. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, think about such things, if anything. If anything is praiseworthy, worthy, think about, think about, think about such things. Whatever, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable. Think about such things, if anything, if If anything is praiseworthy, worthy, think about, think about, think about such things. One more time. Whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, think about such things. Think about such things. Wonderful. Good job, kiddos. Good singing. All right, kids are dismissed to your classes. If you have kids and you've never been here before, follow the herd of children out the doors, and there will be some adults out there that look like they know what they're talking about. They will tell you where to go. Okay? Everybody else can stand. That's okay. Stand and sing. Romans 6, 20 to 23 says, When you were slave to sin, you were free from the control of righteousness. What benefit did you reap at that time from the things that you are now ashamed of? Those things result in death. But now that you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God, the benefit you reap leads to holiness, and the result is eternal life. For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord.
to our God forever and ever. Amen.
surrender my life. I'm in all of you. I'm in all of you. Where your love ran red and my sin washed white, I owe all to you. I owe all to you. that you would captivate our hearts, transform our hearts, Lord, this morning through your word. May we come to the foot of the cross and surrender our lives to you. Surrender our pride. Surrender our shame. Lord, may we leave all distractions and come to you and seek you with all of our heart this morning, God. And may you renew us. May you transform our lives. God, we praise you. You are worthy of our praise and our adoration. Lord, we praise you. Amen. You may be seated. And the ushers can come up for the morning offering. This is our regular offering. Would you bow with me as we offer this together? Father God, you are holy, 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 and worthy of praise. And we want to see your kingdom come, and we want to see your will be done here on earth as it is in heaven. God, we acknowledge that everything that we have is from you. We need you. God, would you give us the strength, the wisdom, the patience, the resources that we need today to walk in fellowship with you. God, we are sinful people. Would you forgive us our sins? Would you teach us how to recognize sin? Would you convict us with your Holy Spirit? Would you, would you show us how to repent, how to walk away from sin, and how we can follow you as we are filled with your Spirit? Lord, would you protect us from every kind of evil and every kind of wickedness? You are King of kings and Lord of lords. It is your kingdom that we want to see grow. It's only by your power that it can happen, and it is for your glory. So God, with all that in mind, we come this morning with an offering, not because we have to or because we feel obligated, but because we want to, because we want to honor you with every part of our lives. And so we give with cheerfulness this morning. Would you be honored and glorified? In Jesus' name, amen. You guys can go ahead. Well, good morning to each of you. My name is Benji. I'm one of the pastors here. Our other pastor, Keith, is on vacation this week, which is a good thing. And actually, I'm going to be gone next week, so just a heads up on that. Um, but my prayer for you this morning is that the Lord would bless you and keep you, that he, was make it, that he would make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord turn his face toward you and give you peace. As we transition our focus from singing and from giving to hearing God's word, I would like to pray again 
and invite the Lord to guide our time and invite you to take this time to ask the Lord to take all the other things that are going on in your mind, your lunch plans, your next week plans, that person next to you who stinks, take all of that out of your mind and to be able to focus on God's word again this morning. Father, you are worthy of all things and this morning you're worthy of our attention. So God, I pray that you would guide us through your word, that you would help us to see clearly what your word says, that we would be inspired by truth, what you have spoken, the life that you lived. Would you guide us to the cross? In Jesus' name, amen. Last week, we were reading in John chapter 18 about Jesus' betrayal in the garden, his trial before the high priest, and then his introduction to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor. In that story, Peter thought that things were getting kind of out of hand, and so he thought it was necessary to take things into his own hands. So he grabbed a sword and cut somebody's ear off. Then he goes on to deny Jesus three times. The high priests, they thought they had everything under control. They were going to execute Jesus. It was going to be flawless, and they were going to kill all of his, um, everything that was going along with his ministry. They were going to just wipe it all clean. Nobody was going to care about Jesus after they were done with him. Then there's Pilate the Roman governor who doesn't even want to be bothered with this because this is so below him, so beneath him. Who cares about Jewish politics? They all kind of felt a sense of control. Meanwhile, Jesus is actually in full control the whole time. He isn't being murdered against his will. Jesus is intentionally laying down his life on his timing for his purposes, even by his mode of choice. Jesus sent Judas out to betray him at the right time. Jesus revealed himself in the garden where he always hung out instead of hiding. Jesus initiated the conversation with the soldiers coming to arrest him. And they drew back and fell to the ground. Jesus protects his disciples as he goes to his own death. Jesus questioned the high priest with questions that he couldn't answer. And Jesus led himself to the only man in the whole territory who had the authority to crucify Jesus, lifting him up, which Jesus had already said multiple times was the way that he was going to die. Each character in the story thinks that they're responding in the way that is in their best interest. They're doing the best thing for them. And you know what? Realistically, that's probably true. But each of them is also being woven together by Jesus in his master plan as he goes to his own death. So this same story of controlled sacrifice continues today as we finish John 18 and step into John 19. We had left Jesus outside of Pilate's home because the Jews didn't want to enter his home because they would be defiled. Pilate already tried to ignore this whole thing and just said, can't you just take care of this yourself? I have no interest in this. But the Jews insisted that Jesus needed to be put to death. And so we start today's passage with Pilate's interview of Jesus inside the house without any Jews present. Chapter 18, starting in verse 33. So Pilate entered his headquarters again and called Jesus and said to him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, Do you say this of your own accord, or did others say it to you about me? Pilate answered, Am I a Jew? Your own nation and the chief priests have delivered you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, My kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting, that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Then Pilate said to him, So you are a king. Jesus answered, You say that I'm a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I've come into the world, to bear witness to the truth. Everyone who is of the truth listens to my voice. Pilate said to him, What is truth? After he had said this, he went back outside. It's curious to me that the conversation starts here with Pilate asking Jesus if he is the king of the Jews. Remember, this is a Roman empire, right? So an empire is the vast domain made up of many little kingdoms and or nations and or provinces. 
And Caesar is the emperor. He's the ultimate sovereign over the entire collective empire, for lack of a better word. Now, under that empire, there could be many kings, governors. Herod, for example, was an extremely wealthy man, and his father, Herod the Great, became king of the Jews, more or less because he bought it out. So I'm not exactly sure what his political persuasion or what his political leadership looked like because he was kind of like the leader of the Jewish people, more or less, even though he wasn't really a Jew, but he thought he was a Jew. He was the king of the Jews, but there's also the Roman provinces, and so there's a Roman governor, and that's Pontius Pilate. So Pilate is representing Rome, and Herod is kind of like representing the people, but they're both kind of sovereigns in their own way, but all under the emperor. Herod is very present in all of the other Gospels, and specifically present in the crucifixion and the interviews with all the people, but John doesn't mention him at all. So we've got kings and governors and emperors, but no one has been saying that Jesus was the king, at least not in this story. Now, a week ago, when Jesus entered into Jerusalem, the triumphal entry, the people were crying out, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the king of Israel. They had said that last week. And I assume Pilate is very well acquainted with that story. You don't just have somebody marching in a parade of people being called the king of Israel and the governor doesn't know about it. So you probably heard that story, but the chief priests that are bringing Jesus with accusations today, they're certainly not claiming him as king. That's not their accusation against him. So why does Pilate start there with his questions? Is this just some little guy from the countryside trying to take over Herod's throne and be king of the Jews? Is he challenging Rome's authority in the territory? Either way, he asks Jesus, are you king of the Jews? And Jesus responds, who told you that I'm a king? In other words, why are you asking? How invested are you in this? Do you do you actually care to know the real answer? Because I'm down for that conversation, but why are you even asking? And Pilate tries to blow him off. Like, Do I look like I care? Am I a Jew? You mean nothing to me. But apparently your people want you dead. So what did you do to get here? And Jesus replies, my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, my servants would have been fighting that I might not be delivered over to the Jews. But my kingdom is not from this world. Interesting that Jesus separates himself from the Jews there for a second. He was going to, if he is a king, he would have to be delivered over to the Jews as if there's a separation between those two categories. Jesus doesn't hide the fact that he has a kingdom, but he is clarifying the nature of his kingdom. It's not from this world. In the book of John, the world is mentioned often as the source of evil and rebellion against God. The world is a bad thing. In chapter 1, the light comes into the world. The light being Jesus came from somewhere else into the evil world. God and his kingdom care a lot about the world. Jesus taught that we should pray that the kingdom of God would come into this world and take over like it does already in heaven, that it would fill the earth. But Jesus' kingdom is not from here. It doesn't function like kingdoms do around here. It is very other. So Pilate skips the whole part about the kingdom being somewhere else because he doesn't really understand that, maybe, I assume. And he jumps to the one thing that he did catch. Aha, so you are a king because you said you come from a kingdom. To which Jesus responds, if you say so, you say that I'm a king. But for the purpose of this conversation right now, Pilate, I came, I was born to bear witness about the truth. So yeah, sure, king thing, whatever. That's not going to help us get to where we need to go. For you and I right here, what we need to focus on is this conversation is about truth. That's what matters right now. Pilate has no time for that conversation. So he blows it off and says, ah, what is truth? And walks back to the crowd. Now, we don't know what Pilate meant by the words, what is truth? He could have been, he could have been facetious and scornful, making fun of Jesus for thinking that there is truth. He could have been impatient. Like, come on, 
the Jews wake me up at six o'clock in the morning to have this dumb trial and you're just going to talk to me about truth? I ain't got time for this. I'm going back to bed. He could have been sincere. He could have been asking Jesus, what, what is truth? We really don't know what he meant by that statement. I've heard whole sermons preached about what he did mean, but we really don't know what he meant. Maybe at this point in the conversation, Pilate just assumes that Jesus is a harmless philosopher wandering about trying to teach the truth to the people. Maybe he's a hopeless dreamer. Either way, Pilate doesn't seem to think that he's a dangerous rebel because Pilate immediately pronounces him innocent. Continuing in 38. After he had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. I'm really curious what Pilate's angle was here. He obviously wants to release Jesus. So somehow when he asked the question, should I release Jesus to you? He was hoping that the answer would be, yes, please release Jesus. I'm curious what was going on. Maybe he knew that Jesus was popular among the people. I mean, Jesus had healed a lot of people. There was a lot of people who were very much on page Jesus. And I'm sure Pilate being the governor, he had heard about the healings. He knew of this miracle man. So perhaps he's thinking, well, the Sadducees, the chief priests, they delivered Jesus to me as a criminal. But they're kind of like the mafia. They're kind of like their own little thing that just does things with lots of power, lots of money, and they get their way. It's like maybe the people at large actually love Jesus. So I know that the Sadducees brought him as a criminal, but I'm going to take him to the people and see if the people want to set him free. But even if that was his goal, the people, the crowd had turned. And they all say, no, we want Barabbas instead. Ironically, side note, Bar means son of, and Abba means father. So Barabbas' name literally means son of the father. And Jesus, the real son of the ultimate father, takes the place of this other son of the father. John also highlights one fact about Barabbas, that he was a robber. John doesn't give any description of the two other men that were crucified beside Jesus, but Matthew and Mark specifically call them robbers using the same Greek word. I'm curious if maybe Barabbas and his two friends were the three guys that were supposed to be crucified, and that's why they happened to have three crosses ready, and that's why everything was in place. But Jesus, the son of the father, took the place of this other son. We tend to look pretty poorly on Barabbas. But I wonder, perhaps he was just a very devout Jew. There was a group of Jews called the Zealots, and their conviction was Rome was ruining and corrupting the world, and the correct response was to stand up. And so they took swords and they fought. They thought they should take back the kingdom of God by physical force out of their zeal and love for God. Very potentially, Barabbas was a Jew who had the Torah memorized, who loved God's word, who was committed to the kingdom, or at least his best understanding of it. I'm really curious what was going on in Barabbas' mind as he sees this other Jew stepping in his place, and he is released. Speculation, that's really not the point of the sermon today. We continue on in chapter 19, verse 1. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. As I read this, I think Pilate, is doing his very best to get Jesus off the hook. He does take him and he flogs him. And flogging is this incredibly brutal form of whipping with a whip that has multiple heads of hard hides on it. So when, as it hits you, it just rips your skin apart. So he takes him and he whips him and he presents him back to the people, perhaps hoping like maybe once you see him pathetic and broken, maybe the crowd will have mercy on him and realize we don't actually need him to die. A whipping was enough. Why else would Pilate be so dramatic about it? He brings him out and says, Hail, King of the Jews. He brings him out and says, This is the man. Look at him again. I don't know what else Pilate would be aiming for. 
Then there's the crown of thorns. All week as I've been studying and thinking about this passage, that's the one image that has just been stuck in my head. Not because of the pain that it would have caused to push thorns into his scalp, but just the ironic imagery. Thorns are so specifically a part of the curse, specifically mentioned in Genesis 3 as a result of human sin. So while the soldiers and Pilate are playing at this game, trying to mock Jesus as a king, Jesus, who is the light of the world, who is the holy of holies, who is the actual king of the universe, is not crowned with honor as he deserves. He is crowned because he is a king. But the king of righteousness is crowned with the curse of sin. So perfectly fitting for the reality of Jesus' mission that he is fulfilling as he wears that crown. That is the crown Jesus, is, Jesus chooses to wear when he is lifted up. Needless to say, Pilate's plan does not work. And the people respond to Jesus' flogging in verse 6. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me? Do you not know that I have authority to release you and the authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it has been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. From then on, Pilate sought to release him. Here I think we really begin to see Pilate waffling and swaying. His hope of pity from the crowd is met with a cry to crucify Jesus. So he tells him, go crucify him yourselves. He really doesn't want to corrupt Roman justice by killing someone that he finds truly innocent. But then the Jews add that Jesus specifically said he is the son of God. Okay, now we're not just talking about kings and political moves. Now we're messing with the gods. When Pilate hears that statement, it very specifically says, when Pilate heard them say that, he takes Jesus inside for another interview. He needs to figure this out. Think about it. Pilate was pagan. Think Greek mythology, Roman mythology. We tend to laugh at mythology as stories and legends and fables, but people really believe that stuff. Jesus had already told Pilate, in 1836, that his kingdom is not from this world, that Jesus is not from Terah. Now, the Jews say that Jesus claims to be the son of God. Think mythology. Think Hercules, the son of Zeus walking around in the world of men. Would killing Jesus anger the gods of Olympus? You know, it's one thing if we're talking about a little political coup, it's another thing if Zeus and Poseidon or Jupiter and Neptune are about to rain down in fury because you killed their boy. Pilate is wigged out by this point, and he's done. It makes sense that he's getting pretty squirmy about this whole thing. He's like, Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus sees the game that Pilate's playing and decides not to play. So he doesn't say anything. Now Pilate's desperate and says, don't you know I have the authority to release you or kill you? I've always heard that statement as kind of a bullying tone, like, you know I can kill you, right? Or maybe from one of like an arrogant, nonchalant, like, you know, I could like kill you, so you better answer my question. I wonder if Pilate was actually like, um, Jesus, well, say, okay, so the gods, and they said, Jesus, who, who are you? I need, you need to answer this question, because I need to know, because I'm supposed to kill you, and I don't know what to do, and other, what's going on? Nevertheless, in his, pl in his plea, he mentions that he has the authority over Jesus' life. And that stirs an answer from Jesus. Jesus responds, 
you would have no authority over me at all unless it was given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Again, Pilate might feel like he's in control of the situation, but he is being played. Jesus is unmoved. Jesus knows who's in control. And it almost sounds like Jesus has given Pilate a free pass. On one hand, he tells Pilate, you know what, you're only going to do what God allowed you to do anyways, just so you know. And also, it's not really your fault. The real sin goes to the person who delivered me over to you. Now, that last phrase used to be really confusing to me. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has a greater sin. Because Jesus had just established that all authority comes from God and that God had given Pilate authority. And so I read that thinking, then God's the one who delivered you over to him. So is God the one with the greater sin? Which is just an elementary reading of it. Jesus is talking about the chief priests. Pilate's just a pawn. You know, he's doing the best that he can with the cards he's been dealt with. Pilate didn't know there was going to be a crucifixion today. He woke up and there's a bunch of angry Jews outside his house saying, hey, we need to crucify this guy. He's like, I don't know. What is Judaism anyways? Pilate wants to release Jesus. He wants to set him free. But that doesn't agree with Jesus' plan. Jesus needs Pilate to crucify him. It's the Jews who are actually sinning here. They're the ones who know God's law. Ironically, God's law is God's word. God's word made flesh is Jesus. They know God's law, but they don't. In theory, they want to honor God, and yet they're murdering God, their own Messiah, their own king. The appearances in this story are just ironic. You have the religious people who are doing everything opposite of their religion. You have Pilate, the political powerhouse. To the crowds, he appears strong, but he can't even make up his own mind. He goes outside, inside, outside, inside, outside. Then you have Jesus, who is just flogged and is all but bleeding out. He looks weak, yet he is fully composed and not shaken by Pilate. So Pilate says, I have the authority over you, and Jesus maybe smirks a little bit. And then Jesus speaks truth. Pilate's now desperate. And from this point on, Pilate is doing everything he can to release Jesus. We get to verse 12. But the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes himself a king opposes Caesar. So when Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judgment seat at a place called the Stone Pavement in an Aramaic Gabbatha. Now it was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about the sixth hour. He said to the Jews, Behold your king! They cried out, Away with him! Away with him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Shall I crucify your king? The chief priests answered, We have no king but Caesar. So he delivered them, him over to them to be crucified. This is perhaps the most damning, despicable, and sad moments in all of Israel history. I know as Christians, it's easy for us to think, well, maybe like the Jews are over there, the Christians are over here. At this point in history, there are no, Christian isn't even a thing yet. These are, these are God's people. These, these are us. These are Jesus' people. He loves them. Jesus came to save them. And to his face, they flat out deny that he should even exist. A clear fulfillment of John's statement from the prologue in John 1, 11, he came unto his own, but his own did not receive him. We have no king but Caesar. What are you talking about? Of course you have a king. It's all throughout the Bible. God established it when he said, when Jacob blessed Judah and said, a king will come from your line. And then you had David and God made a new covenant with David and said, there's going to be a king that rises up, a Messiah that's going to lead you from the people. These are Jews who hate Rome. They hate Caesar. They would do anything to get liberated from Caesar. And they know they're waiting on a Messiah who's going to be a king. 
But just because their panties are in a wad and they feel attacked and their little system of religiosity isn't working, their pride gets in the way and they give their allegiance to the man that they hate most of all. In front of the entire listening Jewish audience, and say, we have no king but Caesar. I have to wonder what the Passover celebration the next day was like. I have to wonder what it was like to go to synagogue next week. And listen to these same men open a scroll and dare to read out loud anything from the Bible specifically the passages that speak of the king. Did the crowds see the open hypocrisy? Did conviction slap the leaders in the face as they read each prophecy that they just saw fulfilled in every way on the cross? Speculation. Meanwhile, from Pilate's perspective, this really clinched the deal because they appeal to Caesar. Emperors were very jealous people. Most of them had to kill to get into their place. Tiberius would certainly not be happy if he received a report that Pilate had a rebel king in his hands on trial and then let him go. Tiberius, in a blink of an eye, could end Pilate's career or his life. This was no longer a question of justice. It was a question of life and death for Pilate. And so our passage concludes the end, starting in verse 16. So they took Jesus, and he went out, bearing his own cross, to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him. And with him, two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priest of the Jews said to Pilate, don't write, the king of the Jews, but rather, this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture, which says, they divided my garments among them. And for my clothing, they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. To crucify Pilate, or to crucify Jesus, Pilate was backed into a corner. He didn't want to do it, but the chief priests outsmarted him and forced him. He seemingly had no choice. And I would imagine that Pilate resented that. And so, knowing that it was the chief priests who were behind all this and that they were Jews, he takes his best jab at Jews through the crucifixion process. Crucifixion was humiliating. It was humiliating to be associated with it. And so he said, fine, you want me to crucify this guy? I'm going to label him as your king, your leader. Isn't, aren't Jews cool because your king is crucified? It was written in every language. Greek was the language of the people. That was the easy language. Aramaic was the local dialect, the local language that was spoken. Latin was the official language of the Roman Empire, political things. John specifically says that many Jews read it. But even in this petty act of revenge, God's plan is at work. Because all Roman public records would show All Jews who walk by would see. All of the world who can read and understand would know that it is clear and even prophetic from Pilate's own hand 
Jesus is the king of the Jews. John adds that the soldiers divided his garments and then cast lots for the one that was inseparable. Psalm twenty two eighteen specifically talks about that in reference to the king. For your homework today, go read Psalm 22, Psalm 22, and look for every single nuance of the cross in that passage. It's incredible. Any Jew who knows the Torah, which is most, who listens to the Psalms, who goes to the temple, any Jew who witnessed the casting of lots should have seen what was going on. Any Jew who sees him lifted up as the serpent was lifted up should have seen what was going on. When Jesus cries out, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's another reference to Psalm 22. Any Jew should have known what was going on. This passage today, from beginning to end, is telling one clear story. The hour is here. Jesus is revealing his true self to the people, and he is the king of the Jews. He is the Messiah that they have been waiting for since the fall. He is the offspring of the woman who would crush the serpent's head. You see it in his authority over every situation he's in. You see it in his crown of cursed thorns. You see it in the sign hanging above him that says he is king. You see it in his garments being fought over, gambled over by the soldiers. This is God revealing his truest form. God is love. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. Some people think love is cute, love is romantic, Mar marriage is love or friendship is love. This is love. This is love. Love is hard. Love is messy. Love is perhaps even ugly at times but it is good and it is pure. God is revealing himself to us. God created us, not just for his own enjoyment so he could watch us exist, but he wanted to share his glory and share his goodness with other beings. But then the beings that he created to share in his goodness and glory, instead of choosing his goodness and glory, we chose sin. We chose chaos. We chose evil instead of choosing God's glory. And way back in Genesis 3, God already decided beforehand that he was going to make atonement for that. He was going to reconcile it, whatever it took, so that he could bring the people lost in sin and death and chaos and bring them back to enjoy the goodness and glory of God because that's why he created us to start with. And he knew to do that, it would take his own life. He knew he would be mocked and spit on and beaten and killed. He knew that love often looks like the opposite of power. It looks like sacrifice. It looks like humility. And Jesus came into the world for this purpose. To shine light in a dark place. And the darkness could not overcome it. Pilate, the chief priests, the angry mob, Satan, and all the powers of hell could not outsmart or overcome Jesus. His truth and his love stand firm. Just like Joseph being sold into slavery in Egypt, Jesus took what other people meant for evil and he used it for good to make his love known to the world, to declare the truth to the world, that Jesus is the king of the Jews, and he is the king of the world. And that because of his love, through his grace, as a result of his humility on the cross, we can have abundant life as we believe in and trust in his name and his name only. Jesus has shown us what true love actually looks like. And he also broke the power of sin over us. He is inviting us to believe in him for salvation and to trust his love. And then he is inviting us to go out into the world and carry that same sacrificial, humble, world-changing love to every nation, 
tribe, people, and tongue. But we can only do any of that when we humble ourselves and repent of our sin and acknowledge that we need help, that it is only Jesus who can save and only Jesus who can change and transform us. I know there's a lot of people in this room that have been following Jesus for a long time, but that's the kind of message that I need to hear again and I need to process personally again. And I would invite you, if that's something you're thinking about, whether you're thinking about it for the first time or you're thinking about it for the 47th time, if that's hitting you this morning, then do something about that. Talk to somebody here in this room before you leave. Pray with somebody and just have that conversation with God again. We need the power of God at work in us. Let's pray. Lord, we are so grateful for the immensity of your love. We worship you, that you are the light that shines in the darkness and it is not overcome. No one can overcome your power and your love. You deserve all honor and glory and praise for all time and forever. Jesus, thank you for your sacrifice, laying down your life voluntarily so that we who chose sin and chose evil so that we could be saved and walk in your love and in your light. God, I pray that you would stir in each of us as individuals this morning because your Holy Spirit is present here with all of us. Would you stir in each of us, what does this mean to me today? What does this mean to us as a church? What does it mean to us as a people what are you calling us to do? How are you calling us to live accordingly? But oh God, we need you. We need you. We cannot do this on our own. It is your kingdom that we want to see grow, not my kingdom. And when I do things on my own strength, it's from my kingdom. It's only by your power that it can happen. And I always want to do things my way, by my wisdom and my, but I acknowledge we can't do this without you. And it's your glory that we're seeking. Left to ourselves, we always seek and turn our own glory. God, it is yours is the kingdom and yours is the power and yours is the glory forever and ever. We need you to be at work in us. Lord, would you send your spirit and fill us and empower us that we might glorify Christ as our king, as our sovereign that the name of the Lord would be honored and praised. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Would you stand up for benediction this morning? May you know the length, the height, the width, and the depth of God's love for you. May you bear every good fruit as you are filled with this Holy Spirit. May you be strengthened by his glorious power so you will have all the endurance and patience you need. May you be filled with joy, always thanking the Father who has enabled you to share in the inheritance that belongs to his people who live in the light. For he has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. In the power and love of God, go in his peace. You're dismissed.